Howdy everybody in YouTube land. Uh, back to our regularly scheduled programming for a little bit. I've got a pile of car audio amplifiers that I need to get fixed and get out of here. And uh, these have been sitting around for a while and I've got approval on the parts and stuff like that to get them fixed. Uh, you've probably seen my last videos where I've done repair assessments and things like that on some of these. Most of those were either returned unrepaired or fixed already and gone. And I didn't get much video on that because, to be quite honest, I'm not like a lot of those guys out there. I don't have professional video production skills. I don't have, you know, professional video equipment, tripods, lighting, you know, editing software that you can insert clips in and stuff like that. And I don't have any of that stuff. I, I kind of, when I do these videos, I shoot from the hip because I don't, it's just not what I do. That's not my main thing. Uh, I just strictly do these videos for you guys to either enjoy them for entertainment purposes or maybe learn a couple things here and there. Um, you know, that's basically it. I'm not monetized anymore. I don't have a YouTube partner account anymore. And matter of fact, I just got an email notice the other day that they did a review that I'm still not eligible for monetization and that... They're going to completely kick me out of the YouTube Partner Program, which also means my videos will probably get dropped back down to 15-minute time limits and stuff like that now. So it's only a matter of time before I actually leave the platform because I don't do enough with videos to really warrant continual use of the platform. But anyways, I digress. As long as I can continue making quick little videos that for the stuff that I do and if you enjoy them I'll continue to do so the best I can but I'm not perfect I'm only human but anyways I digress back to the topic at hand I've already done a quick assessment on all of these amplifiers so this video is just basically to show you what I found and the repair and me testing it on the bench and going through it and stuff like that but this is a punch P400 X2 I've already got the shields off, and um, this guy has, see, a bad channel in here, which was causing it to go immediately into protection mode, which is very common when amplifiers fail. Sometimes you'll blow up the whole power supply, sometimes not, sometimes you just get lucky, sometimes you don't get lucky. But it is what it is. All these covers come off. I've already got all the screws loose. I don't like how these are put together sometimes, but it is what it is. So here we go. Now that I got all the hardware dumped out of it and the front cover or rear cover played off, uh, this channel was the bad channel, and I cut one of the transistors out because it was shorted. So I got my meter on, and you can probably see that these are... Um, gonna be hard to do with uh, me holding the phone but yeah that's not normal so if I go from here to here trying to do this single-handedly is impossible yeah I can't do it uh, don't have a tripod I don't have you know professional video equipment or anything like that so not much I can do about it. I might be able to do it from back here. Yeah. Shorted. The ones in here are not shorted. But I ordered the parts just to replace all four of them anyways. Because I've noticed with these amplifiers that if you just... And I've, I've actually... That's a pet peeve of mine. Because I, the other reason why I quit working on these professionally is because... I've gotten a lot of these that have been worked on by other people and lots of times the repairs are less than stellar and you'll I'll, you'll you'll see that in some of my later videos where I, I got a JL 300 by four that uh, yeah you got to see this thing it's 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 a complete monstrosity but I digress the trouble I see with a lot of these is people will just replace that one part like, oh, I'll just put another transistor in there. I'll get the one with the right part number if I'm lucky. Sometimes some people will just throw anything in there. I've seen it. Um, so they'll just put one in there, throw it together. Oh, it's fine. 
No, it isn't. These, even though this is a class AB amplifier, or it might be class GH, I'm not sure. But either way, it's linear. It's not class D. Uh, as you can tell by these, you know, poor resistors here and bias potentiometer. But this thing is, you know, a linear amplifier. And most of the time you can get away with just changing that one. But these are MOSFETs. It's not like these are NPN transistors or PNP transistors, bipolar transistors. These are MOSFETs. So if one of them failed catastrophically, the planetorial alignment of electrical conditions that caused the failure would have been witnessed by the rest of these three transistors, or the rest of them. So whatever happened to that one, this one probably saw the same stresses as long as with these. So it, yes, it may work. And when I did snip this out, I did plug power into it, and it did come on, and I did not have a protection light. It actually actually came on and worked fine. But who's to say that as soon as you put this thing under any kind of a load, that that transistor there fails right next to it. So when you work on these, and it's especially true with the power supply transistors, you always want to change all four of them. Uh, you know, this is a policy of mine internally. Um, and, and it's probably, it probably doesn't matter, but for me, it does matter. And that is the power supply transistors. When I order these transistors, I make sure when I order them that I get them batch matched, that they all come from the same batch, which means when these transistors were manufactured on the production lines, they're all from the same silicon wafer. They're all from the same dye. They're all manufactured on the same line at the same date and the same time. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all going to be identical in specs, but they're going to be fairly close. So it's like tube matching. Think of that for a second. So I try to match these MOSFETs the best I can so the power supply characteristics are evenly matched. So I'm not creating noise or one transistor is handling a higher load than the other one. Because, for example, the... Uh, the RDS on value, the you know the resistance between the drain and source could vary from transistor to transistor under full load, or even full saturation. Uh, but I try to get them as close as possible so they can evenly distribute the current as much as possible. Because when these, especially on bigger amps, when they're under heavy load, these things are switching high amounts of current, and if one of them is not quite up to par, it can it can actually overcurrent that one transistor real easy and it goes boom. So when that transistor explodes, that dumps the current off to the rest of the transistors or even worse damages the driver, the driver transistor or IC, wherever it is, um, or however the topology is set up. If it damages that, then it might produce a malformed waveform that blows up all the rest of the transistors. Next thing you know, you have a cascade failure, and now you've got a you're, you're screwed. You got you, your board's completely destroyed, and you'll see that on some of the other amplifiers. But um, yeah, this guy here has to be when you, when you're doing power supply transistors, and I, I say the same thing with class D output transistors too, because it's also switching transistors. Anytime you're using parallel transistors in a switching circuit, I try to match them up as best as possible. Um, will they work? from different batches from different you know time periods yes it will it will work how stable it will be i don't know but from what i've learned in the past you try to want to match these as best as you possibly can so let's go ahead and get this board out of here and we're going to go ahead and you know pull these transistors out now that we have the board removed we can start uh removing all those older transistors now i'm probably going to um now well, let's see. First off, I'm going to pull the pins of these, and then I'm going to pull the rest of these out. And I will put the board in and physically place the transistors in the correct positions first and then tack them down. Because chances are when they manufactured this board, they probably had a jig to set all these in. So they were at the correct heights because of just how the heat sink is laid out. Um, I'm going to need to... Make sure the transistor's in the right place so when the clamp goes on it, you know, it hits them properly. Now that all the transistors are out with that nice little tool right there, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put this board over and put the new ones in. With the board temporarily in place, that will allow me to just 
just go ahead and just probably put a screw in here so it doesn't move around as much. Uh, so now I've got my outline where the transistors originally were. And I got some thermal compound I'll put on there. And we'll be able to get the new transistors mounted in place. And, and that reminds me, another rant of mine. I mean, absolutely look at this heat sink. Look at the ungodly amount of thermal paste that they used on this stuff. I mean, this is just... That, that's ridiculous. You know, I've got a sensory disorder anyway, so when this stuff gets on my fingers, it just drives me absolutely nuts. Uh, but I digress. That, that's ridiculous, in my opinion. The only, the only spots that it really matters is right in front of the transistors and this thermal plate here, which why that's there, I don't know. With thermal paste behind it, the, the, the gaps in the middle don't need thermal paste. Uh, I don't know if that's the way the machine worked that laid this out. You know, I, I don't, I don't know. That's just ridiculous, though. Just for the rem frame of reference, these are IRF fifty-two tens, and these are IRF five forties. So I'm just going to go ahead and set these in like that. Probably, I need both hands to do this properly, but just bend them in. Well, I got to put thermal paste on there first, but just bend them in there, and then. As soon as I have it in the position it needs to be, take a little solder. That's all there is to it. Transistors are installed. I got the thermal compound on it. And the last thing left to do now is to put all the screws in, anchor it down, and check the bias. And make sure everything works properly. Now we're all anchored back down. So let's get the power supply wired up, check the idle current. Um, the way I'm going to do that is, since I don't have the service information for this, I'm going to compare the biasing from the good channel to the out the bad channel and then check if they're similar. If not, I'm going to adjust this one to match this one. That's how I'm going to do this for now. As far as the driver components or any of the other little stuff down here, I didn't mess with any of that because none of that stuff was bad as far as I could tell. I checked your typical, your gate resistors. The driver transistors are on the other side of the board. Uh, check those everything appears to be good. So I just went ahead and changed the outputs and we're going to see what happens Okay, so we're powered up. I was drawing a little bit of excessive current this stage here was measuring 0 0.003 volts across these resistors This one was measured in 0 0.010 So I went ahead and adjusted the biasing. So this is now 0 0.003 That now matches this stage and that's a little bit more manageable current draw. So um We'll go ahead and hook up the sound, get this thing um, into my test speaker. We'll run a some kind of a tone through it. I don't know what yet. I got to, because my phone is also my camera and I need something to plug into this thing because, oh yeah, that's another thing. Headphone jacks on phones. Well, kind of got to have them when you're doing stuff like this. Sure, there's, you know, a plethora of test equipment you can have like, harmonic distortion analyzers and frequency generators and blah 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 blah. I don't have all that because I don't do this as a profession anymore it's kind of as a hobby so uh I'm going to just use my phone which I think I still have my old phone so I'll charge its battery and we'll do a sound test with that Alrighty then now we have it powered up it's idling I've hooked up the affected channel and because I don't, I don't have a wire to the other speaker over there. But for now, let's just hook up the affected channel. So I have the, the function generator app open on my old phone. And the reason why this phone was retired is, well, after dropping it, it kind of, the glass came up a bit and the earpiece quit functioning. Uh, anyways, so we have the uh, function generator set up. So we'll just go ahead and turn it on. It's set for 440 hertz. And as you can tell, we have a tone. It's fairly clean. Volume pot's dirty. I'm going to have to uh, do something about that. That's where it's going into clipping. You can hear when it does. Sounds very clean. I don't have an oscilloscope handy right now to actually check the waveform, but judging by the sound of it, I don't have to worry about it. And just for uh, 
completeness. Let's check this other channel. Yep, that channel works fine too. Okie dokie then. Turn that off. Let's see if we have a... Let's see if we can put some... Of course, I'm going to have to play royalty-free music. I can't just play anything because you know how YouTube is. It's it's stupid. Alrighty then, that is going to conclude this video. The amps that I have to come after this one, I won't be quite as elaborate with the um, video. I won't get as in detail because it's basically the same process and I'll go over that here. What I like to do is when I get these amplifiers in that are blown or malfunctioning or whatever, I typically do not power them on right away because... Yeah, in most cases, the damage to the circuitry has already been done, but I don't need to damage that circuitry any further. So I usually always take the cover off and I do a quick analysis. And the first thing that happens is when it comes to troubleshooting, you got sight, sound, and smell. Your three most important senses. So when you pull the cover off, you always want to look at things as sight. And you can smell the carbon tracking and the burned semiconductors if it's been you know exploded and then when it comes to sound well that's when you power it up and if you're hearing abnormalities in the circuitry like if this transformer screaming or you hear something go pop or something like that you know what i mean so um and when, when an amplifier like that the first rule of thumb the first thing i go to especially when ones that have been damaged is the output transistors because those handle the highest amount of current and those are usually what goes the first so then I do a rough check of all the transistors electrically. And if I see anything, any abnormalities or I see anything shorted, that's not obviously visible. Because if it's visible, like for example, if this resistor is brown or black compared to all the rest of them, you know that channel is the one that's damaged. So you can go straight to that channel. You can check the other ones for collateral damage. But if they seem to do a quick check okay, I wouldn't even spend your, spend your time spinning your wheels with that. I'd go straight to the affected channel. And then I check all the output transistors. Okay. Well, then I check the power supply to make sure the power supply is not damaged. If the power supply is not damaged, what I do is I check, I physically check each and every output transistor. And I'm looking for ones that read a slightly lower resistance than the other ones. Because normally these are in parallel with the exception of a gate resistor or a base resistor a lot of times. And then, of course, the drain or source resistors there. But, um, or in a bipolar amp, an emitter resistor, collector resistors. But I ch those resistances add up. So if you're reading this transistor and this one over here is shorted, you'll, it'll, it'll appear shorted here, but it'll be a slightly higher resistance. And I'm talking milliohms sometimes, or even 10 ohms, 20 ohms, whatever the resistances are in here. So you'll get, instead of 0 0.000, you might get 0 0.005 or 0 0.008. Uh, not always the case, but a lot of the case it is. So then I find the one that's got the lowest resistance and I snip it out of the circuit. And if there are other transistors paralleled with it in that circuit, like in the case of this one, there's two and two. So one was shorted. So as soon as I took it out, I measured again, the short went away. So the next thing I do is then I power it up. I power it up to make sure it doesn't blow the second one out. And then, because I'm changing it anyways, it doesn't matter. But if it runs and it's stable and it seems to do okay, it's not going to be exact. It's not going to be correct because it's missing the transistor. So the bias is going to be off. But uh, if you remove that transistor, yeah, it can't handle as much current, can't handle the same output power, but it will still handle audio properly. And in this case, this amplifier did. So as soon as I removed that transistor, the short went away. I looked around that transistor for immediate damage of the resistors or anything like that, and I didn't see any. I measured the base resistor, or in this case, the gate resistor, 
and it wasn't open. So I also measured the drain resistor here, and it too wasn't open. Everything was fine. And I checked for sound. Before I made the video, I checked for sound. It was all good. So I knew when I put this on the shelf to order parts and do an estimate on it, I knew what it needed. So then what I did was I replaced the shorted transistor and the other ones that didn't test shorted, but it could have sustained similar damage internally that just hasn't reached to that point yet. So did that, replaced all the four transistors, and rebiased the amplifier uh, through the pot right there. I had to break the glue off. So I biased this to match this side, and everything's good. It works perfectly fine. This side clips a little differently than that side. And that could be because the IRF 540 transistors on this side, this has 540 ends. And I ordered 540s by mistake. They are slightly different, but as long as the amp is biased properly, you shouldn't have much of a problem with it. Um, so this clips a little bit differently than this side, but you shouldn't be driving these into clipping anyways, because that's what kills these things. So, uh, yeah, that's it. That's it for this video. That's it for this amplifier. And, uh, thank you for watching. Please leave a comment if you have one and, uh, we'll move on to the next one.